Well, Scooter was right. You guys sing and play pretty, but what's amazing to me is how ten people can manage not to draw attention to yourselves. You know, you give our, you lift our attention up to the Lord. And we thank y'all for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, let's start out like this. How would you picture the perfect day for you? A picture of contentment for you. If you woke up this morning and you were like utterly, totally pleased with the way things were going on. Bruce, if you can go ahead and put that slide up there. We're going to be talking about contentment this morning, but I want to engage you early, okay? What would be your perfect morning? Would you be in the trolley motor seat of a bass boat on a glassy lake with a big bass on the end of the line? Maybe that for some of us. That would be pretty cool. Or for you, would contentment look like this? Would you be sitting in a rocking chair on the front porch of a log cabin in Colorado what, looking at a pretty sunset? Would that be contentment for you? Maybe uh, I have a demented sense of contentment, but what, the first thing that comes to mind for me when I think of contentment is a cow lying down under a shade tree chewing her cud. I don't know. Maybe uh, that's not what you thought of this morning. But we're going to talk about contentment this morning. And uh, you may ask, well, why, why contentment? Why talk about that? For one thing, it's in contrast to the uh, Ecclesiastes two-part series that we did a couple of weeks ago. You know, totally pessimistic, not content at all at the end of his life. So I thought, let's balance things out a little bit and let's, you know, talk about contentment today. But apparently I wasn't the only one thinking about it. I did a Google search of contentment, just type that word in and hit go. And 14,400,000 websites appeared in 0.57 seconds. Really did. And so this must be a subject that other people are thinking about as well. But you know, I was thinking this morning, there's some folks, in fact, Gino Ducharme left this morning about five. Did he leave on time, Billy? And he headed east to go help the folks in Louisiana because this is what they woke up to this morning. Go ahead and show that next slide there, Bruce. That's what they woke up to this morning. You know, the flood victims there in southeastern uh, Louisiana that got 20 inches of rain, some of them. In fact, a friend of mine, uh, Steve, he's a BSM director at LSU, Louisiana State University. He was in Glorietta, New Mexico the week the rains came, and when he drove home, guess what he found? Five feet of water in his house. And so they're going and helping mudding out those houses. In fact, this week, weekend, this Labor Day weekend, 400 college students went to Louisiana to help with the mud out effort. So pretty cool, huh? But you know, I want to be like the person who could do that right there. They've got all their stuff in, out at the curb and the house is muddy and, and the sheetrock's going to have to be torn out and all the insulation's a muddy mess and it is well with their soul. I want to be like that. In fact, years ago, I memorized this one of the verses on the sheet, and I'm going to reference a number of verses that speak to me about contentment. And they're on the sheet that's in your bulletin insert there. And there's a reason why we have those printed out today. They won't appear on this, because when they appear on this, you can't take them home with you. But I asked Lori to print these up so you can take these home with you. Maybe one or some of these passages will speak to you as well. But two or three years ago, I memorized 1 Timothy 6.6. 6, and it says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. And that verse prompts me over and over and over to, you know, even if it's an oxymoron, say it like this, to pursue contentment. And so I really do want to be, I want to be content in the Lord. I want to be like the person who put that on their, I guess that was their kitchen cabinets, you know, out there on the curb as well with their soul. It's how I want to be. Then I looked up uh, the word contentment in a thesaurus. Go ahead and show that next slide if you would there, Bruce. And this is what I came up with. Huh, it kind of ended up strange on there. That's supposed to be two columns. And uh, content at the top, and then synonyms and anonyms. And so let's go down the synonyms list. Fulfilled, serene, satisfied, ease, and glad and peaceful. I don't know why those aren't lined up. They were lined up real pretty on my computer screen. But uh, I'm content with that. It turned out that way. That's okay. Let's see, antonyms. You know, the opposite. 
Disappointed. That's what Solomon was, wasn't it? When he made his speech, remember the first word out of his mouth? Worthless. He was disappointed. Disappointed, mad, miserable, sad. And here's the way I want to do it. You know, I sometimes think more highly of myself than is real. And uh, uh, Kelly and the kids can, can vouch for that. So here's what I'd like for us to do. Look at those two columns. And on the uh, contented side, or on the lack of the antonym side, the opposite of contented, what word would the people very closest to you, which of those words would they pick to describe you? Maybe this morning. And so let's go, go at it from that perspective, okay? Oh, I want to be cheerful and glad and contented and all that sort of thing. But uh, if I'm not seen that way by others, then I've still got some work to let God do on me. And so that's a, I'm going to take one of those for myself. And uh, huh. let's get over it quickly though, okay? We're going to talk about contentment this morning. And I hope it does you some good. You know, it's funny, every Sunday morning, here I am, you know, this guy posing as a preacher, uh, your interim pastor gets in his truck in San Antonio and heads to Del Rio. And when I'm coming, actually you're going south on eastbound I-10, y'all know how that is in San Antonio, and I'm exiting to go west on 410, and I'm making that curve around there, there's this big old huge billboard. And I'm going to spare you the picture of the billboard. There's a big old huge billboard for this. For elective surgeries. <laughs> for cosmetic surgery. So you can maybe imagine what kind of picture it would be on that. And uh, there it is, big old billboard. And you thought preachers aren't even supposed to see that sort of stuff, right? But there's that billboard every Sunday morning. And then, on Monday afternoon when I go back home, I'm at that same intersection, except I'm going down 410, going east. I'm exiting to go west on I-10, which actually goes north. And uh, when I make that exit and I turn around and the highway straightens out, another big old billboard there for elective cosmetic surgeries. Again, spare you the picture. But here's what those billboards remind me of on Sunday mornings. How discontented we are as a people. You know, somebody's paying good money because they're counting on our discontentment, even if the way we look. One of the cool things about getting older is the vanity meter kind of fades away, doesn't it, guys? <laughs> and we become less and less concerned about our appearance, but we still relate to that. We still know what it's like. In fact, Americans last year spent $13,500,000, 13 billion. $500 million on elective cosmetic surgeries. You know, people who stand in the mirror and say, God, couldn't you have done better than that? And they go play good money to get somebody to change the way they look. And so even the discontent that's express, expressed by those billboards, I'm thoughtful of that, you know? that we're discontented. And how that counters with Psalm 139. It's on your sheet here. In fact, let's see where they are. I didn't give these to Lori in any particular order. It's on mine right here, Psalm 139. And it talks about the care, the loving God with no lack of resources went to when we were being created. David recorded this. You put me together in my mother's womb. You did. All you do is strange and wonderful, I know it within my heart. When I was being formed in secret, carefully put together in my mother's womb, you knew I was there. You saw me before I was born. And so, a loving, sovereign, no lack of resources God put you and me together just right just right. To be content with that. To be content with that is part of my pursuit. And uh, I want to be, even with the way that I look. You know, even uh, if you're not concerned about your appearances, and some of us are getting over that, how about this? You know, one of the things that does happen when we get older is our concern for our health <laughs> becomes a subject. How many times do you see people my age gathered together talking? How often is the conversation 
about health issues. We do it all the time, don't we? Well, how are you feeling today? Well, I'm feeling pretty good. And how often, you know, our conversation just reflects, maybe it's not necessarily discontentment, but we're aware of it, aren't we? That this earth suit will fail us, and in some degree already is. Buckner Fanning used to say, you know, when they were cutting parts off of him, he said, I guess I'm going to heaven on the installment plan. <laughs> but uh, we are. We've become aware of our, uh, of our health issues. And many of us have a few of them going on, don't we? We do. And uh, in fact, this week I was with one of my heroes. I'm going to go ahead and say his whole name. Jordan Luna is one of our interns at the Baptist Student Ministry at Texas A&M. And I was with them on Tuesday doing some things and had great fun with them. Now, Jordan is just the most delightful guy you could ever be around. He was an Aggie graduate, and that's, that's good, bids him well. But the, the thing about Jordan to me is he is so comfortable in his skin. He is the picture of contentment. And this is what makes it amazing for me about Jordan. When he was a little baby, in fact, he was a twin, and he and his twin sister were born weeks early. And when he was born, he told me he weighed two point, how, so, so many ounces, a little bitty. He was 12 inches long, tiny, preemie, very, very, very sick little, little boy. And because of some of the complications, I don't understand all this, but he had, uh, oh, what's it called? I wrote it over here. Um, ah, there it is. Cerebral, pro cerebral palsy. I probably don't say it right. But uh, because of that, these years later, he's 22 now. He walks kind of with a strange little limp. And uh, one day he was walking across the campus, Texas A&M, and there were some well-meaning, certainly, folks there at a table and they were, you know, sharing their faith and engaging people in spiritual conversations, and they saw Jordan coming, limping. In fact, Jordan had hurt his knee playing soccer, and he, what he called it, I was crutching along. He was on crutches. But even without crutches, he has this limp. Well, these guys kind of accosted him. Hey, don't you know that God's powerful and he can heal you? He can heal you right now. He can heal you on this sidewalk. What, let us pray for you that God will heal you. And Jordan's going, hey, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm content. I'm already all right. No, 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 no. No, God can heal you. And he said, he already is. He said, you know, God has already spoken to me. Second Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, it's on your sheet there. He said, I've already done, had this conversation with God. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, three times I prayed to the Lord about this and asked him to take it away. You know, Jordan has prayed about his health issues. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I think Jordan's got it down. What do you think? I think he does. I think he does. He wasn't discourteous to them, but he told them, hey, you don't know. You don't know my story. God and I have already had this conversation. And you know how I am with it? Tranquilo. I'm cool with it. I'm okay. You know, God is taking care of me. And my limp, and my crutches remind me that he is sufficient. And I must need that reminder or I wouldn't have them. So it's okay. I'm okay. Content. What a cool, what a cool hero for me. Fearfully and wonderfully made, our appearance and even our health, reminder of God's sovereignty and his goodness. Well, if your thing isn't about your looks or if it's not about your health, you know, your body, your earth suit, is it, what is about stuff? You know, frankly, 1 Timothy 6.6 6 reminds me not to need stuff. And so how many times have you said, like I've said, oh, if I only had fill in the blank. Oh, if I only had a better car. 
Oh, if I only had a better horse. Or what, oh, if I only had a better house. Or fancier clothes. That one's ne- Or a new purse. That's one that I've never done. <laughs> but how often we, you know, we're bombarded, are we not? Uh, when we watch TV, listen to radio, drive down the highway. We're bombarded, bombarded by people who are saying, hey, you'll be really content, you'll be really happy if you have this. And guess what? We will sell it to you. As if contentment could really be bought. Let me save you the trouble. I've thought of it. I've, I've thought, man, if I had a better truck, I'd be content with that. Or I had a better horse. But let me just save you the trouble. None of those work. Oh, they're all blessings that come from God. All of them are. But they're not a source of contentment that lasts. They're really not. Because you know what? Every car going down the highway is going down. <laughs> and if our contentment rests in things, it's resting in things that are on the way down. It's called entropy. Everything is in a, the state of being, you know, going away, going away. So contentment's not the stuff. Jesus himself addressed that Matthew 6, it's in your sheet again, Matthew 6. Very familiar with this passage from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous sermon. And he says this, 625, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. You know, chill out. What you'll eat or drink about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food. And the body, more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. Bruce, let's look at the bird. And he says, every time you see a bird, think of this. I'm taking care of you. You don't have to worry about it. You can be content of this. I'm going to take care of your needs. I very carefully chose a sparrow, just a normal old bird, and uh, sitting on a rusty barbed wire fence. But every time that we see any bird, we can say, That's Jesus reminding me that I'm going to take care of you. Stuff won't take care of you, but I will. And then Jesus goes on. The passage, you know, verse 26, after the look at the birds of the air, they don't sow or they reap and are stored in barns yet. Their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Great question, huh? Can any of you add one, can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life. And why don't you worry about, or, and why do you worry about clothes? And he has another picture he wants us to see in our minds. See how the flowers of the field grow? There's another picture. I tro- chose a picture of blue bonnets in a field, because we are in Texas after all. But for me, frankly, my favorite kind of field to look at is weed free. Some hybrid version of coastal Bermuda that's about knee high. And that reminds me, God's going to take care of your needs. And every time we see a field, just think. Jesus told me when I see that, to think about how well he's taking care of me. Or about the field, the flowers of the field. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the one we talked about two weeks ago, and all his splendor was just like, dressed like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more so will he take care of us, oh, you of little faith? You know, if stuff would make us content, we'd have more stuff, I guess. But it won't. It won't. We're going to get to what will in a minute. In fact, uh, it was David, Solomon's daddy, You know, the 23rd Psalm, next slide if you would, Bruce, is uh, maybe the most famous statement in all of the Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. I think of the Lord as a shepherd. You know what? He's not incapable. He doesn't ever go to sleep. He doesn't ever get tired of me. And he's taking care of my stuff. No Mystery at all, while that may be the most popular passage in the whole Bible. The Lord's my shepherd. I have everything, everything. I have everything I need. And so my stuff is enough. 
I like uh, my cousin Charles. He uh, lives down in Houston, works for NASA. And he bought, he bought a brand new Ford truck, diesel truck, in 1985. And he's still driving it today. It has over a half a million miles on it. And you know what? Charles is content with that truck. And it's a testimony to him of how God takes care of us. He just keeps on taking care. You know what? Can you imagine how many TV commercials tried to beg him to buy a new truck? He has endured while well, 31 years he drives the same truck. <laughs> yeah, I like Charles. I want to be like Charles. You know, I don't need new stuff to be content. It'll all go away anyway. But everything I need, I'm going to have it. Let's keep on going, okay? <clears throat> How about contentment with what I do? You know, I've talked to a few of you who are in school this morning, and I said, hey, how's school? And uh, school's getting mixed reviews, in case you wondered. And uh, some of you are just going, hey, this is cool. I have good classes and good teachers and good friends, and I wake up enthusiastic every morning. And you're wondering, what kid is that? Yeah, I could tell you. And then some of you may be a little less enthusiastic about the school deal, but just think of it. What a privilege it is. Do you know that everybody in this room is paying the price for you to be able to attend school? They are. Anybody who owns a house or anybody who rents a house is contributing to a, a fund. We're all pitching in and we're all giving. And uh, we're the ones who are paying the bills so that you have that school to go to and that teacher, and those books. And we are really sold on the importance of it. Everybody in this room, and we're contributing to it. So the days that maybe you wake up, and you're going to school, and you're a little less than enthusiastic, just think of picture of the people in this room. We're all paying your way. Because we believe in you. We believe that your education is important. And we're helping you get it. So we're all doing that with you. So if, you know... Uh, content with what you do. If it's school, do it good. I, I was not a good student. The main thing I wanted out of school was me. All those years. You know, 12 years of public school. I just wanted out. I crammed my four into five years of college. I just wanted out. And when I went to seminary, somebody said, what do you want to get out of seminary? Me. I just mostly wanted out. But now I look back on it. Language school. You guys, Baptist paid for me and Kelly to go to language school in Costa Rica. And I was miserable. I've been there. But looking back on it, I'm thinking, what a privilege that was that folks from all over the country were contributing that Kelly and I could go to Costa Rica and learn Spanish. I wish I would have had that attitude then. I didn't. And I regret it. But I do now. I'm real thankful that you guys paid my way to learn Spanish. And uh, so if, if school's what you do, uh, look at it maybe a different way. What about your job? You wake up every morning to go to work going, man, I'm the luckiest duck in Del Rio. I get to go do that. Or is it kind of like, okay, one more day. How many hours to retirement? You know, um, and you know, we talked about it a few weeks ago, how you know, most of us, there's something noble. We'll back up and look at it with eternity's perspective. We can see the noble value in what we do. Can't we? We really can. So many of you are in, are in jobs. You're directly serving people. I was thinking about this morning, Pete, I'm going to call you out. I was thinking if I, had woke, if I woke up in Del Rio and my air conditioner was out, you know what I'd want? I would want Pete to come fix it fast. And so if you're fixing air conditioners or whatever the thing that you're doing, just think of the service you know, that you're doing for people. The, the nobility in that, and thankful for the privilege to do it instead of, oh no, I've got to go again. And just to be thankful about that. Contented with our jobs, the jobs that we have. There's a story that I was going to show you the video, and last night when I sent it to Bruce, he, he, he emailed me back, are you talking about this one? And I said, yep, I am. And uh, there were a couple of things that made it questionable. I'll just tell you the story first. Stephanie Oliveria 
began modeling when she was a young girl. She was the daughter of Bebeto, who is a famous soccer player. They caught football down in Brazil. And a friend of her dad gave her a job with a modeling agency. And they had some pictures there that were not totally inappropriate, but questionably, right, Bruce? To show in church. And so uh, uh, she was traveling through Spain and Japan and Mexico and China, modeling for various famous clothing designers. She was on a luxury vacation in Italy. And after a week of partying, a night of partying, went back to her room, and guess what she felt? Empty. And there she was living the dream of so many girls all around the world, and she felt empty. And so... She decided that glamorous parties and fame weren't satisfying and uh, that all of this stuff did not make her feel whole, didn't make her content. So she decided. She became a missionary. And I don't think you decide to become a missionary. I think God calls you to become, be a missionary. And she heard that call and responded. And guess what she's doing now? She works in a garbage dump out on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. And she's sharing the gospel with kids, many little girls who are involved in prostitution. And she's going, she's going to a dark part of the world to share the bright light of Jesus. And here's this girl who, you know, from the... From all appearances, had everything going for her. Man, she didn't wake up in the morning going, oh no, i got to go to work. She was living the dream, and the dream left her empty. Now, like I mentioned, most of us already have jobs that are noble, that we would just be thankful for the privilege and do them diligently as unto the Lord. Probably all we need to do. But sometimes, God kind of turns our world upside down, doesn't he? And we're on a track, and he says, hey, I've got a different track for you. And that we would always, every day, always be open to God saying, hey, got a different track for you. And we'd be ready to do that. But contentment doesn't come out of those things either. Even when it's a noble thing. Contentment itself doesn't really come out of that. In fact, uh, you may have heard, I think it was this morning, Mother Teresa was made a saint uh, by the Pope. And uh, even she had some times that she felt empty. She confessed that in her own life. Because even doing noble things isn't good enough. So, well, what is then? If it's not our looks, if it's not our health, if it's not our job, or even our school, or something like that to give us contentment, what in the world then can? Well, Paul gives us a hint. And this is actually the focal passage of this whole message. And so let's go to that next slide up there, if you would, Bruce. And it was Paul, and he says these things. And he's talking about how thankful he is for the people that are going to be sending somebody. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need for it. I've learned, here he is, but look at the verb, I have learned. That's what I'm doing today in front of you. I have learned to be content. In whatever circumstances, the King James translation puts that, in whatever state I'm in. Proof positive that Paul wasn't a Texan. But I have learned to be content. Some of you got that. In whatever my circle. When I woke up this morning, you know, you and I weren't in a bass boat. We weren't in Colorado. But you know what? We're going to get to the real secret of contentment right here. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, what it is to be, to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in each and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or want. Here it is. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Contentment? I can do contentment. I can do all things. Through him who gives me strength. Now you would expect a preacher to say that. Jesus is sort of the source of contentment. But you know who wrote that? He's a man who is sitting in a Roman prison. And he had learned the secret of contentment. Whether in a prison cell or out preaching the gospel. Because he's with me. He's with me in a prison cell too. Yeah. That's what Paul had to say. The secret of contentment is not about circumstances, think of that word, 
the circumference, the circumference, circumference around circumstances, that which is exterior on the outside. Circumstances aren't going to do it, however good they may be. He learned the secret, and it's Jesus on the inside. It really is. And I can be sick, and I can be dis displeased with the way I look. I can uh, maybe be challenged by my job. But it's uh, very true, very true. It's not just the preacher talking, it's the guy sitting in prison talking. He said, I learned the secret of contentment. And that's Jesus in me. It's Jesus in me. Yeah. He's the source. So let's go ahead and uh, go to that next slide, okay? You see, it's not really at all. This has faith. You can even edit in, use a synonym for, for faith, which would be also contentment. Contentment's not about everything turning out okay. Contentment is actually about being okay, no matter how it turns out. My friend Jordan, he was okay. I'm okay. God's taking care of me. And so, uh, even if, go ahead and go to the next slide if you would, Bruce. If whatever version of the thing, the circumstance in our life that puts us in a position where it is well with my soul may be hard to say. Remember, it doesn't have anything to do with the outside stuff. It really doesn't. It really doesn't. Only to do with the inside stuff. And you know what? Jesus can cure that today. Paul had to learn it. I'm still learning it to be content with him because I keep on being lured by billboards and commercials and everything else. But you know what? That's the source, isn't it? Jesus in me. One of these days you and I will lose our health all the way and to be able to say it is well, well with my soul. That's why we came this morning to affirm that. That's why the praise team led us a while ago to remind us that Jesus is really, really is the source of contentment in my life. Stuff can still be unraveling. It is. It is. But I'm okay. Because I know he's in charge.